Buying your first digital camera can be confusing and a little bit daunting because when you start to do your research online, you're seeing all these numbers pop up and figures and you're thinking, well, how much of that is important and does it really relate to me and my photography? Remember, it's not always about how much you spend because the most expensive camera within your budget may not be the right thing for you. Of course, there are advantages for more expensive camera, but you can take perfectly decent photos with cameras under $500. So in this video, we're gonna look at six key things that you should consider before buying your first digital camera. And we're gonna look at it right now. So let's get into it. Hello, my name's Stuart Beebe and thanks for watching. So before I start, I should just point out that this is not mere a case of telling you which model of camera you should buy or which brand or how much money you should be spending on your first digital camera. We're gonna be looking at the technologies it specifically relates to photography to hopefully help you make your best and most informed decision before you go out and buy your camera. So the first thing we're gonna look at are lens choices and focal lengths. Now, of course, the benefit of buying a system, no matter what brand, with detachable lenses is the fact that you can swap the lenses out pretty simply depending on what type of photography you're into. For example, if you're into shooting uh, sports or wildlife, you want to get close into the action. So therefore, you'd want to switch out your lens with a lens that's going to give you a longer focal length, maybe even as long as 300, 400 or more millimeters. That's going to get you really close into the action. However, like I say, if you're into landscape, you're gonna to wanna to kind of shoot generally, you wanna see most of that scene, so you're gonna to wanna to shoot nice and wide. Most cameras on the market, you know, under $500, uh, they're gonna come with what's called a kit lens, and the focal length range is anywhere from 18 to 55 millimeter zoom lens, they're telephoto zoom lenses. That's gonna give you a nice range of, you know, an 18 millimeter, you're traditionally gonna use a wide angle lens when you're shooting a landscape scene. So for that, we need to zoom out, and capture the scene, we're gonna twist the lens round to 80 millimeters. However, if you're more interested in shooting people, portraits, uh, then you really wanna zoom in closer to that your subject, uh, perhaps to 55 millimeters, which is the maximum this lens will go to. And you can see then it's gonna zoom into your subject and it's gonna give you the ability to blur out the background a little bit more because the more you zoom in, the more opportunity you have and capability you have to blur out the background behind your subject. So why do aperture values matter? Well, I'm assuming that you're buying or wanting to buy a camera to get creative with uh, photography. It's no good really buying a camera and spending, especially spending a fair amount of money on it and just leaving it in auto. So you're gonna to need to really learn how to use your new camera in manual mode, which is really where the aperture values come into play. And by the way, if you're interested in learning how to use your camera in manual mode, please subscribe to this channel because I'm gonna be covering that in the next video. All right, so let's have a look at aperture. So if we refer to this chart here, you can see that the lower the aperture number, the lower the F number, means that it will allow more light. In other words, the camera lens will open up, allowing more light to come through your lens and hit in your sensor. And this, when you see that a lens is capable of low light performance or better low light performance, it means that the aperture is gonna open up meaning it's a lower number. So if you have a kit, kit lens, like this one here, the minimum aperture this will go to at 55 millimeter, remember I zoomed in to my portrait and I wanna take a photo of a portrait, it's zoomed in and the minimum aperture on this particular lens here is 5.6. If you look at the chart, you can see the size of that lens is a lot smaller than compared to a, an aperture value of 1.4. So therefore, what this is saying is that a kit lens that only has a minimum aperture of 5.6 when zoomed out, it means that there's gonna be less light coming into and through that lens to your camera. So with most kit lenses, they're gonna come with what's called a variable aperture. So if you see uh, the F number, let's say for example, that goes from 3.5 to F 5.6, that can be a little bit confusing, so I'm gonna now attempt to explain what that actually means. When we open up the lens, this kit lens here, to 80 millimeters, you can see that the lens inside, it's opening up, it's the barrel is opening up, which will allow more light to come into the camera. So that's at f3.5 when we've zoomed out. 
But when we zoom in to 55 millimeter, you can see now that the barrel is closed, which is not gonna let as much light in. So in other words, when, we're, when we've got a variable aperture, it means that depending on the focal length, the zoom that you're choosing is gonna determine the minimum amount of aperture that this lens is capable of. Remember, this all is determined about what type of photography you're interested in. Because you know, this kit lens, even though it only has a minimum aperture of 3.5 when zoomed out to 80 millimeters, or 5.6 when zoomed in, if I'm just gonna be taking pictures during the day, we don't need a lot of light coming through because it's already nice and bright outside, so perfectly fine. However, if you're interested in, let's say, nighttime photography, where you wanna take pictures of the Milky Way in a really dark sky, a lens like this is just not gonna cut it because you need as maximum amount of light coming through that lens as possible. So we're gonna to need to be dropping down the aperture down to uh, 2.8, at least really, ideally two or even 1.4. I mean, my 1635 lens here, this is a pro lens, this has a minimum aperture of 2.8. And this is pretty decent when I'm taking pictures of uh, the night sky. So again, it, it really does depending on what type of photography you're interested in and really when you're gonna be using your camera. So let's now look at the camera sensor itself. So in my Canon 5D Mark IV here, I have a what's known as a full-frame sensor. Whereas in my first camera here, which I got 10 years ago, it comes with a crop sensor. You may see this in your description. It's gonna say an APS-C, which is essentially a crop sensor. Now, depending on the manufacturer, they're gonna determine, I mean, I think uh, Nikon say it's a, you know, the D range of Nikon is gonna be a crop sensor, whereas the F range is gonna be a full frame sensor. The different manufacturers will have different descriptions for their sensors. There are a number of different sensors out there, including micro four thirds and smaller. And think about the camera sensor that comes within your smartphone, which is tiny. So let's have a look at the differences there now and how that relates to photography. So when shooting at 16 millimeter, the red line here is what a full frame sensor will give you in terms of the field of view. If I use the same focal length, 60 millimeter, with a crop sensor, this is the yellow line here represents what the crop sensor field of view is gonna be. The way around that, of course, is to use a wider focal length or just simply move the camera back a little bit so you get a wider view of the scene. So here's another example using my full frame camera with a 16 millimeter focal length shooting this property here. Then I switched over to the crop sensor using the same 16 millimeter focal length. You can see now how much closer I am to this property. So the way to get around that, of course, again, is to set the camera further back or use a lens that's capable of going wider. So if I shot uh, the same scene now with at 12 millimeters, you can see that's a lot closer to the original full frame sensor 16 millimeter. So that's really a full frame versus a cropped sensor and the differences that's gonna give you. I don't have a, uh, a micro four thirds uh, sensor to give you the demonstration, but what I do have is my mobile phone and I took the same scene with my Google Pixel 3. Bear in mind, of course, a mobile phone will have to have a very small sensor because a phone is a lot smaller than a camera, so they need a smaller sensor. But camera ma phone manufacturers get around that by provide the lens they use is super wide. So that at least is gonna you know, overcome that huge crop difference that you're gonna get in the mobile phone sensor. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna look at is the ISO range and the capability of the camera that you're looking at. There are cameras out there that will have a really large range of ISO. Uh, my camera, for example, this professional camera here, goes from 100 ISO to 32,000 ISO. Now, I will be honest with you, I've never shot anything more than, I think, probably 6,400 ISO. And that was probably once in an extreme situation. So why wouldn't I wanna go up any more than that? Well, because the higher the ISO, the more grain and you're gonna get in your image and the more your image is gonna be degraded. If you see this example here, I took uh, a photograph here of my, uh, my friend, Captain America, in the studio here, and first of all, I took a picture of him at uh, 32,000 ISO. You can see the amount of grain and how much the image is yeah, pretty speckly and, and not really great quality. 
I then went down the range and I went down, I've got one here at 6,400 ISO, and then I went down all the way down to 100. Remember that the best quality images are gonna be shot with a lower ISO. So even though cameras out there you know, will give you this huge ISO range, you're not really gonna be wanting to shoot at such high, high ISOs because it will degrade the quality of your images. Again, this goes back to really what you wanna do with your photos after you've taken pictures of them. If you wanna blow your images up, then that grain is gonna show if you're using a high ISO. So you wanna keep that ISO as low as possible. So even you know, though these cameras will show a very large ISO capability, it doesn't really matter too much. You're not gonna to wanna to go too high. Um, I mean, this camera here, for example, uh, the, the first camera I bought, only goes up to an ISO of 1600. But when I shoot this at 1600, the image is pretty poor. So the advantage, however, then, of the large ISO range is if it is large, you know then that you can shoot pretty high ISO and still be comfortable within the range of uh, that, that sensor. Again, remember this goes up to 30, 32,000 ISO. So when I shoot a 6,400 you know, 6, ISO, it's still, it's passable. It's, it's still, I, I wouldn't really go that high. I'd always aim to get lower. Whereas if I shot this at 1600, you could definitely see the difference in, in grain and the quality. So again, something to consider there is the ISO range of your camera. Next up is autofocus points and the number of autofocus points that the camera is capable of. If I take my older camera here, it has nine autofocus points, which means when I look through my camera here and I press the trigger down, it has nine possible points in my scene that I can focus on in, in particular. If I look at my more modern camera here, this one here has 61 focus points. Now I don't use all 61 focus points, but it has that capability. There are also other autofocus op uh, options in this camera that you know far outweighs a cheaper camera here. But again, you don't necessarily need 61 autofocus points. I was perfectly happy in this camera here with nine autofocus points for many years. And in fairness, I still probably use the center focus point as one point on this camera, probably 95% of the time. So you don't need all those autofocus focus points, but again, if you're, it depends on what you're shooting. If you're uh, perhaps um, interested in um, sports and fast moving subjects, then actually having that range of autofocus and maybe zoning out is gonna be a good thing for you to consider. But again, most people for everyday shooting, the nine autofocus focus points is more than enough. So what about frames per second and is it important and does it really matter to you and your photography? Well, it depends on really, again, what you're gonna be shooting, what you're interested in photographing. Um, most consumer cameras will come with the capability of three frames per second. Remember, this is different to the video capabilities that your camera is gonna come with. Video is shot in either 24, 30, uh, 60 frames or even 120 frames per second. So we're not looking at that, we're actually gonna look at still life, uh, sorry, photography, and that's the number of shots you can take in burst mode. So take this consumer camera here, if I give you an example, which shoots at three frames per second. Now take my Canon 5D here, and this shoots in seven frames per second. So you can see the difference there in speed. Now, you know, are you gonna need seven frames per second or more? Again, it really de depends on what you're interested in shooting. If you're interested in landscape, still life, product photography, or even portraiture, you're not gonna need seven frames per second necessarily. However, if you're interested in shooting something that's fast moving, for example, you know, wildlife, you know, birds, or even sports, then you're gonna need a faster frames per second because you're gonna need to get a lot of frames you know, probably to get one in focus. Take the, uh, the guys that work in the uh, sports industry, the guys that, you, that they use very expensive cameras uh, that shoot up to 20 frames per second, okay? But you're not gonna need that to start with, okay? So again, it really depends on the type of photography you're interested in, would, interested in will determine how many frames per second you actually need. So the last thing I wanna talk about is the accessories that you are possibly gonna need 
to buy with and you know, ongoing with your camera. Because remember, when you're buying a camera system and lens, you know, you're just, that's just the starting point, right? You've got to think about all the accessories. You may be thinking about you know, additional lenses, as we've talked about, to give you that kind of lower aperture and, uh, and focal length. Uh, you've got tripods, which are essential, by the way, if you're interested in getting striking images with landscape. Flash, if you're interested in taking portraits. Flash is, again, almost essential. As you develop your photography skills, you're gonna to wanna to be getting into more flash photography. Then you've got your kit bag to put it all in. The memory cards. Finally, you know, editing software. Now, editing software, you can get free editing software or you can you know, buy the Adobe Suite for $10 a month. But these are the things that you have to consider when you get into photography. Remember, it's not just the camera system and the lens that you're buying. It is all these additional things as well that go with it. I will just warn you that you know photography, it, it is an expensive, um, it's a great hobby, but it's also an expensive hobby. So just be prepared for that. And you know, you may be saving up your money to get the best camera that you possibly can, but just be mindful of you know, ongoing costs and ongoing accessories. And trust me, the more you get into it, the more you're gonna want the better lenses and, and you're gonna wanna upgrade into you know, more expensive cameras as you get more into the uh, the hobby. Remember, remember that I get paid for the photography that I do, so I, have features in this that I need. But when I was starting out, this was perfectly great, which was again, $300. So hopefully this has helped you with making an informed decision on the camera that you wanna buy. Remember, you know, of course, fit within your budget, but just remember the other things. But also remember about the capabilities and the options that your camera comes with. There are a lot of other things that I haven't talked about, for example, Wi-Fi capabilities, and all sorts. There's a whole plethora of things that cameras are capable of. But again, it, these are the things that I think are most important to you uh, as you start your photography journey. So I hope you found that of interest. Uh, if you have, please give it a thumbs up. And also remember to subscribe to this channel and hit the little bell because my next video will be about, you know, when you've got your camera, we're gonna start taking you through how to use your camera in manual settings, which I hope that's your plan because Frankly, there is no point in buying a, a great camera with amazing capabilities if you're not gonna take it out of the auto mode. So look back here and I'll help you out with the uh, manual settings on your camera. Okay, so uh, bye for now and I'll see you next time. Take care.